In a prior video, we looked at some of the youngest champions in wrestling history. But what about the flip side to that? What about the people who managed to win some gold while approaching senior citizenship? Yes, being of an advanced age doesn't necessarily make it any less likely for someone to find success inside the squared circle. In fact, it might make it even more likely. But what are the best examples of this? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. And where better to start than with the time Terry Funk became ECW World Champion at the ripe old age of 52. Yes, despite already having had a Hall of Fame-worthy career twice over by that point, in the mid-90s, Terry Funk decided he still had some gas left in the tank and that he wanted to use the remaining time he had left to help get the next generation over. So that was why, throughout this period, he became a regular fixture of the Extreme Championship Wrestling roster, with him using his star power here to help get the fledgling Renegade promotion off the ground. So giving was the Funkster, in fact, he'd make pretty much everyone he went up against look like a million bucks. It didn't matter if it was Shane Douglas, Sabu, or Tommy Dreamer, whenever anyone stepped into the ring with the Amarillo native, they shone brighter than they ever had before. And that was why, as a thank you for all he'd done for the company, on April 13th, 1997 at Barely Legal, ECW's first pay-per-view, Paul Heyman booked the legend to win the promotion's world title from then-champion Raven. Sure, Funk was an old man at this point, so by the strictest of logic, he should have been easy prey for Raven. But then this is wrestling we're talking about, and the unwritten rule is that people only level up more the older they get and it wasn't as if the fans didn't want to see Terry win the big one anyway. No, he was absolutely beloved by the live crowd in attendance that night, so when he finally scored the winning pinfall, they erupted in an ovation. But not every older champion over the years has received such a positive response from fans. In fact, some have received an outright hostile one by comparison. That said, if you're a heel, then this is the goal at the end of the day. And there's arguably no bigger heel in the world of wrestling than Vince McMahon, particularly during the time he also became ECW World Champion at 61 years old. Now, we will add the caveat here that this wasn't ECW proper. No, this was the bastardized WWE CW version which came about after the success of 2005's One Night Stand pay-per-view. So when we say Vince McMahon was the ECW World Champion at one point in 2007, we can at least say it wasn't really the same belt held by the likes of Taz and Tommy Dreamer. That said, it still counts as a title run, and because of Vince's advanced age when he won the belt, it earns him a spot in this video. Hell, as far as we can tell, this win might actually make him the oldest world champion on record, at least in North America, that is. And the fact that it was the prize once held up as being the shining beacon of the counterculture makes it hurt all the more. But then we suppose that's how the boss wanted us to feel about the whole situation after he pinned Bobby Lashley for it during a three-on-one handicap bout pitting him, his son Shane, and Umaga against the Almighty at that April's Backlash show. Of course, this wouldn't be the only time Vince McMahon won a world title though, as almost a decade prior he'd done the same thing in his own company too. Yes, in a truly Vince Russo-esque move, it was back in the autumn of 1999 that the boss pinned Triple H to become the WWF World Champion. But how did such a bizarre moment come about? Well, at that point, Vince was in the middle of a heated feud with the game, one which would soon get even more personal when Stephanie McMahon got involved too. Before that happened though, it was all about the owner of the company trying his best to embarrass his rival by getting the strap he held so dearly off of him. And that's what led to a one-on-one -on -one match between the two on the September 16th episode of SmackDown that year, a match which by all rights Triple H should have won with ease. That said, what he wasn't counting on was the fact that Stone Cold Steve Austin had made an uneasy alliance with McMahon at this point, and so as a result, the Rattlesnake was only too happy to get involved and help screw the game out of the victory. That's right, Vince McMahon of all people was now the WWF Champion right at the height of the Attitude Era. Sure, he would vacate it the following week, so it wasn't as if he held it for a long time, but it goes down in the record books as a win regardless. Still though, for as old as the boss was here, he wasn't the oldest champion of the turn of the millennium era. No, that's a distinction which goes to only one person, the fabulous Moolah. Yes, at the ripe old age of 76, Moolah would become the WWF Women's Champion. Sure, her place in history was already secured by then anyway, as someone who'd technically been women's champion for decades. 
In fact, in official WWE canon, she's recognized as having held the original women's title all the way from September 18th, 1956 to July 23rd, 1984, a 10,170-day run which dwarfs anything Bruno San Martino ever did. That said, for as big of an achievement as this was, arguably the even more impressive achievement was returning to the ring with Mae Young in 1999, right as the Attitude Era was at its peak, and from there, immediately getting involved in a program with then-women's champion Ivory. And that wasn't all Moolah was doing here. No, she'd actually go so far as to win the belt once more during a one-on-one -on -one match against the champ at October 17th's No Mercy pay-per-view, with this victory making her the oldest women's champion of all time. Sure, she would drop the belt again just eight days later, but like with Vince McMahon, it's not the length of the reign which is important, it's that it happened at all. And that same logic could be applied to our next subject as well as it happens, because despite winning world titles everywhere he went during the 70s, 80s, and even 90s, the last of Ric Flair's reigns with the big gold belt lasted for less than a day and happened when he was 51 years old. That's right, we're headed into WCW 2000, so strap yourself in because it's about to get stupid. After all, this was the year where the once mighty company's top prize changed hands a total of 25 times, and six of those reigns were vacant. So perhaps it's fitting then that the Nature Boy's last go around with the belt that he helped make famous would be so anticlimactic. And the reason it could be described this way is because it came about as a result of some of the most nonsensical booking ever. Basically, after beating Jeff Jarrett and Scott Steiner in a triple threat match on the May 23rd episode of Thunder to win the belt for the third time himself, Kevin Nash decided he didn't really deserve it. No, as far as he was concerned, the person who really deserved it was Ric Flair, and so that was why he chose to simply give him the title on the following episode of Nitro. Yes, you heard that right, the final world title run in the legendary career of Slick Rick actually happened because he was simply handed the gold. And to make matters worse, he'd lose it later on that same night when he was defeated in a one-on-one -on -one bout against Jeff Jarrett. Still, even if it was dumb, it doesn't take away from the fact that the Nature Boy was still technically winning titles into his 50s. And that wouldn't be the last one he won either, because six years later, when he was 57, he'd become a WWE World Tag Team Champion with Rowdy Roddy Piper. Of course, you could make the argument this one was even more important for the Memphis native, as Piper had long been a hero of his ever since his early days in the industry. So to get a chance to not only team with him, but become a champion with him, must have felt like a dream come true. How did it happen though? Well, at Cyber Sunday on November 5th, 2006, Flair was booked to challenge then-world tag team champions The Spirit Squad, with his partner to be chosen by a fan vote. And when the fans voted for Hot Rod himself to be the Nature Boy's teammate, they wasted little time in making short work of their male cheerleader opponents, with the geriatric stars getting both the win and the titles after just 6 minutes and 55 seconds. That's right, it was a special moment for fans who'd grown up watching the two, and it was equally as special a moment for the performers themselves as well. The only thing which could have made it even more special, in fact, was if the yin to Flair's yang in WCW, Sting, was involved. But at that point, he was far too busy working for TNA, the very place he'd later become world champion at 51 years old. Not that this would be the only time Steve Borden became TNA world champion, however. No, quite the opposite, because during his run there, he'd win the gold a total of five times. That said, for the purposes of this video, it's the final reign we want to focus on. The one which came about when, after losing the belt to Mr. Anderson at June 12, 2011's Slammiversary pay-per-view, he'd transform himself into Joker Sting. Who was Joker Sting? Well, he was basically an updated version of the character, one designed to play off of Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Clown Prince of Crime in The Dark Knight. And with this new look and attitude then, the Stinger managed to not only quickly earn himself a rematch against the new champ on the July 14th episode of Impact, but also a victory, as after all was said and done, he'd be holding the belt above his head once more. And what made it all the more impressive he was doing this was by then, he'd firmly entered his sixth decade of life, a period where no one should be athletic enough to stand on top of the world of their chosen sport. But then Sting has never been a normal man, and neither has another of his former WCW peers as it happens, because when it comes to Goldberg, he'd go one better by becoming WWE Universal Champion when he was 53. Now it should be noted that this is a title run which was mired in controversy, as it came at the expense of arguably Bray Wyatt's finest creation, The Fiend. 
and because of that, it became a tipping point of sorts for many fans who, rightly or wrongly, could only see Bill as the villain in the aftermath of things. Basically, it was in early 2020 that, after almost being ruined again by Vince McMahon's booking, Wyatt had managed to revive himself once more by finally getting his Universal title reign on steady ground, with it being expected he'd be defending this against Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 36. And that's where Goldberg entered the fray, because at the final hurdle before Mania, February 27th Saudi Arabia show Super Showdown, he'd challenge The Fiend for the gold in the main event of the evening. And in a decision no one was happy about, he'd actually go on to win this one, making him the oldest Universal Champion on record. That's right, in what might end up being the former WCW Champion's last run with a top prize, he'd splutter out here as it quickly became clear live audiences wanted to see Bray in that position instead. After all, there really was no need for Bill to hold the title anymore at this point, especially as his planned bout against Roman Reigns at the Showcase of the Immortals would end up getting cancelled anyway on account of… well, on account of the state of the world in 2020. But even if it wasn't one most fans look back fondly on now, and even if it did serve as a line in the sand for many fans who wanted to see the end of the part-timers coming in and stealing all the glory for younger stars, it's still an achievement nonetheless for Goldberg to have won a world title so far into life. Of course, we're sure if you ask our next subject, he'd say there was nothing special about it though, and that's because he rarely has a nice thing to say about the Georgia native these days. Who are we talking about here? Why, Bret Hart of course. And the reason we're talking about Bret is because he can also hold a claim to being one of the oldest champions in wrestling history too, as it was on May 17th, 2010 that, against all odds, he became WWE United States Champion at 52 years old. But how did such a thing happen, especially as the Hitman had long since retired by this point on account of concussion-related injuries? Well, as it turned out, as long as he didn't take any bumps, Bret could still put on something which resembled a wrestling match. And this is what allowed him to step into the squared circle once more that night to take on then-champ The Miz. Of course, even if it was the excellence of execution we're talking about here, given his advanced age and the state of his health, most would still have pegged Mike Bizanin to defeat him. But that wasn't what happened in the end because, in a nice feel-good moment for the live Toronto crowd, after being announced as a surprise opponent, the hitman caught the champ off guard and went on to tap him out with the sharpshooter in a matter of minutes. That's right, after all those years, and after so many had told him he'd never wrestle again, Brett was technically able to prove them wrong by holding the US title over his head. Sure, it would be a short reign on account of his inability to actually perform in a proper match going forward, but it was still nice to see it happen anyway. So when he was named Raw General Manager the following week, and he took that opportunity to vacate the gold, most were okay with this. After all, getting to see the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be with a title at all anymore was a treat most hadn't expected, and it gave a nice sense of closure for the man who'd left WWE so bitterly years prior to that following the events of the Montreal Screwjob. Hell, if nothing else, it served as a better finale for him than his match against Vince McMahon at WrestleMania 26, and it also must have been rewarding for one of his fellow Canadians who'd carried so much guilt about what happened back then, our next subject, the man who famously became WWF Hardcore Champion at the age of 59, and that's Pat Patterson. Yeah, even if him being the first ever Intercontinental Champion is a more important moment historically, that doesn't mean the time Pat Patterson won some gold during the Attitude Era isn't notable in itself. After all, by this point, he was pretty much the oldest person on the roster, and so even stepping in the ring at all anymore was an achievement on his part. Not that the Montreal native was a regular performer in 2000 though. No, he was still effectively retired, with him only appearing in the occasional bout, usually as part of a comedy act with his fellow stooge, Gerald Briscoe. And so limited was he in these matches that you could be forgiven for thinking he was never a full-time wrestler at all. But he most certainly was, as back during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, he'd traveled all over North America and Japan, with him collecting a treasure trove of gold as he did so. It didn't matter if it was the AWA World Tag Team titles, the NWA United States Heavyweight title, the aforementioned WWWF Intercontinental title, or any number of others, whenever there was a belt on the line, Patterson usually left with it. So perhaps it should come as no surprise then that when he became an on-screen figure once more during the late 90s, it would only be a matter of time until some hardware was around his waist again. After all, even if he was in his 50s, it was still Pat Patterson we were talking about. 
and as it happened, there was a belt which was perfectly suited for him at this point, one which had been carried for the better part of the prior year by Crash Holly. That's right, the kayfabe nephew of Hardcore Holly had spent much of the first half of 2000 making the WWF Hardcore title relevant by defending it under 24-7 rules, meaning anyone could challenge for it at any time. And that's ultimately what led to Gerald Briscoe taking advantage of this stipulation on the June 19th episode of Raw that year, when he attacked Crash backstage and pinned him in short order. Of course, his fellow Stooge Patterson would be right there to celebrate with him once he did so, at least for a few seconds, because after realizing he wanted to hold the title too, the French-Canadian decided to smash a bottle of champagne over the head of the former NWA World Junior Heavyweight Champion, with this giving him the chance he needed to roll him up and steal the belt away for his own. Sure, like with some other reigns we've talked about today, this one would be short-lived, as just a few days later at June 25th's King of the Ring pay-per-view, Pat lost his prized possession during a hardcore evening gown match, pitting him against Briscoe. So it's just as well that this wasn't the last time the inaugural Intercontinental Champion held gold in WWE then. No, over a decade after that, when he was in full-blown senior citizenship at 78 years old, Patterson would become a champion again when he won the spiritual successor to the hardcore title, the WWE 24-7 Championship. And with this victory then, he'd officially become the oldest person to ever hold a title in New York, and quite possibly in the entire world. But how did it happen? Well, after being booked to appear as a special guest legend on the July 22, 2019 episode of Raw, the man who regularly drove them all absolutely banana back during his heyday got one more moment to shine when he ran into then 24-7 champion Drake Maverick and managed to score a quick pinfall win over him. Was it a moment which will go down as being among the greatest of his career? Probably not, but it served as a nice coda anyway, as only a year later Pat would die of liver failure at the age of 79. So given what we know now, it was probably for the best that he got to have one more run with some gold, even if it did only last a matter of minutes before he lost it again. Still, like we said earlier in this video, the length of the title reign isn't what's important in cases like these. No, it's that they happened at all. And while our next entry can't say that they were older than Pat Patterson when they won their final belt, they can say they did it at an age no one would have expected them to. Who are we talking about this time? Who else but Chavo Classic and the time he became WWE Cruiserweight Champion at 55. Hell, not only did he become Cruiserweight Champion here, he actually beat his own son to do so after he pinned him on the May 20th, 2004 episode of SmackDown. And it wasn't like this would be a one and done reign either because following his big victory, Chavo actually went on to defend the belt for a few weeks against the likes of Funaki, Jacqueline, and even John Cena. Really then, considering the fact he was able to do this despite being at a point in life when most people just wanted to have a sit down and a nice drink, it has to rank as one of the most successful late in life title reigns of all time. But given we're talking about Chavo Guerrero Sr. here, former NWA World Junior Heavyweight Champion and NWA International Junior Heavyweight Champion, should this really come as a surprise? No, it shouldn't because when it comes right down to it, there really is no upper age limit on having what it takes to be a successful wrestler. 